are live. Welcome to those of you who are joining us tonight on Facebook. Um, it is the fourth night of Sukkot, correct? Is that it's fourth night? We have uh, four more nights, three more nights, four more nights. I'm, I'm mixed up with the days. I don't even know what day it is, actually, to be honest. I keep thinking today is Tuesday. It's all meshed together. Well, when you're living in the Sukkah, you think of it, the people who are actually following it, who live in warmer climates, who don't have to deal with the cold and everything, they actually live there. Like, you think of just living in the sukkah, everything that we use to tell our time, to tell what day of the week it is, to tell, you know, our surroundings, so everything that's familiar with us, if that's removed, you step into an almost timeless dimension. Uh, and I think that's Yahweh's plan is to have us step into that dimension where we're removed from what's going on in the world around us. Um, much like the Israelites in the land of Goshen. You know, they're right in the middle of the land of Goshen, but there was light in their dwelling while there's darkness all around. And that's what it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be a visual reminder. It's like the tzitzit. We wear the tzitzit as a visual reminder of who we are and the commandments that we are following. And the sukkah is supposed to remind the generations of those who came out of Egypt. You know, it's something that even if you were a, um, you were a uh, descendant of them and you never actually experienced living in the, in the booths in the desert, um, it was supposed to be something that was a visual, tangible thing to get into your senses. Um, I like how it says it in The Chosen when they're having the episode where they're talking about the Feast of Tabernacles. And it's like every one of us has at some point wandered in the wilderness. At some point, we've dwelt in booths in our lives, temporary sh shelters. We've been in a kind of a temporary place in our lives. And Yahweh's plan is to bring us in that temporary place to teach us how to, to rely upon him, to trust in him for everything that we need. He's our provider. He's, he's the one who's really giving us the security. And then when he brings us into the promised land where there's houses you did not build and, and crops you didn't plant, you're going to remember it's him who did it for you. You know, your own hand didn't bring you this. It's him who did it for you. And so there's, I mean, Sukkot is just rich with lessons. You know, each year we come around to the same season, we see something that, from a different aspect. It's like the facets of a diamond. You're seeing different aspects of it each time you look at it. I remember the, the year when um, we had visitors from Yeshua's birth. <laughs> we had the manger scene people come. And, you know, you, hearing things from different perspectives really does put things in perspective for our own lives. And, like, how, how would I walk if I was in their shoes? How, how would it be like to be in the Israelite shoes where they're living in the middle of the desert? I mean, you can think of that as being a bleak place and all that but at the same time the the they were led by the cloud by day the fire by night they had the tangible presence of god there they knew that they were being provided for from heaven the manna that fell um the water out of the rock all those things that they saw was meant to be such a um such a, a indelibly marked inside of them that they would never forget it for the generations to come and the things that Yahweh's marked us with are, are meant for us to remember for the generations to come. I don't think there's going to be too many more generations. I, don't think, I think we're the last generation. But it's for us to carry out whatever time we have left here until the rapture happens and to be, to be walking according to that. Amen. Well, tonight we have another excellent message coming. We know it's an excellent message because the enemy tried everything he could do to stop it from coming, but alas, he has failed. And we have a message from Scott tonight. Thank you. Yeah, so I had spent quite a few hours getting this message ready, and then uh, when I went to save the file, disappeared <laughs> so this message is it's funny because I got in the car to come here tonight and I was like oh that's kind of funny because the the um, the message is I'll get to where what it where it goes to but you'll see how it how it fits right in with what happened to this message is an example of the message itself tonight 
So some of it's missing because not all of it came back, but it still goes good. So I start off with, um, I was going back over my old stuff, I, and I have like a bunch of old files, and I, I found stuff from 2016, and and was looking at those and searching around, and and then I found uh, that I don't know if any of us have ever talked about the lulav and the etrog. I don't. I know Dad probably mentioned it a couple of times, but that's about it. And so that's that palm branch thing with the with the lemon on the side that they wave and. So and that all comes, of course, from the rabbis because the scripture. Um, I don't know if I have it down here. Yeah, on the first day you take branch. Uh, try that again. On the first day you to take branches from luxuriant trees, from palms, willows, and other leafy trees, and rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. So that's all scripture says. Kind of like the the seed seeds. It just says, put tassels on your garment, and the, the rabbis create the rest of it. And then it becomes law and everything like that with them. So <laughs> so this uh, that's the same thing with the lulav and the etrog. So I looked into like what the things were, and it's pretty neat. Like all the stuff that, that they have woven into what that is. And so the etrog is the citron, which is... Similar to this, this is a lemon, but I think, is it exactly a lemon? Yeah. I don't know what the difference is between a citron and a lemon, but there's some difference. Although I have seen some of them that look like grapefruits, they're gigantic. So, <laughs> so, so that is, uh, that part of the, do they have a name for the whole thing that you know of? Okay, yes, so the four species, um, is, is the whole, the whole thing. So they, they have that. And then the um, so the etrog on that, which is the lemon part, it's that represents your heart, because your heart should be producing fruit. And then they take the lulav, which is the palm branch, and that represents your spine, and that's like there, that's representing your structure and your strength, because everything in all your systems run through your spine. If you, you know, break your spine, everything can go wrong. So like all your all the nerves and everything run through there, <clears throat> and then uh, so from there they have the, uh, the 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 spine is also like the strength of the whole thing. I think that's where they attach everything to it, and then you have the myrtle, which is a, I don't know that must be one of the luxuriant trees. <laughs> so um, the myrtle represents eyes. We actually have a plastic version here. I just noticed when I was looking at it. So the shape of it's actually like an eye, depending on your nationality. I don't want to exclude anybody, but <laughs> so it's like the almond shape eyes. So the, the that's representing the eyes of, of the people. And the it's in Matthew six twenty two. And it says the eyes are the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, then your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. Then if the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? When I looked that up, <clears throat> that's actually not about what you're looking at. It's an idiom, they call it. And that is, because um, the verse before it is about money. In verse 19, is don't store up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust and moth, rust and vermin destroy. I didn't notice know which uh, version I picked up here. I've never seen the vermin in it before. <laughs> where moth and rust and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. Uh, and then the verse after, verse 24, is the one that talks about no one can serve two masters. You either love one and hate the other, and you can't serve both God and money. So that's where I think they, they kind of look at it, and it's like, this is an idiom. It doesn't actually mean what you're looking at. So... They was like, okay, what is an idiom you might ask? So this raptor. Relax for a second. <laughs> so what is an idiom you might ask? An idiom is a group of words established by usage as having a meaning not deducible from those of the individual words themselves. You have to say it like that because it sounds so much more intellectual when you say it with the British accent. <laughs> If I said it like in someone from Alabama, it wouldn't sound the same. 
I did have a friend who would do Alabama accent talking about nuclear fusion and stuff like that, and it was hilarious. <laughs> Just doesn't fit. <laughs> talking about particle accelerators and stuff like that. <laughs> so we use these idioms all the time. Um, like a piece of cake, once in a blue moon, a bed of roses, when pigs fly, and it's raining cats and dogs. Now, if you were to read these things in a book of ours, 2,000 years from now, <laughs> you would think we had problems. And you would think that we had some very strange animals on this planet at this time, and some extremely interesting weather patterns. So this verse is about generosity. It's not about what you're looking at. So in Hebrew, that's called Ein Tova, if I'm getting that right. It's called the good eye. Now, if you're a generous person and you meet the needs of others, they would say that you had a good eye. So it's not always about money. So those of you who don't have all that much money, you don't get off just by saying, well, I can't do what those rich people do. So, so maybe you're in the supermarket and you see somebody who may be vertically challenged and <laughs> come across someone who, who can't reach the top shelf. And maybe you can. So you could... You could give them a hand, and you've, you've been generous and met their needs. She has a shirt that says that. She, she can do anything but reach the top shelf. <laughs> so, so or perhaps you've uh, also come across someone, you may know them, that may be cranially deficient or have uh, be lacking in cranial capacity. You could help them out with some of your wisdom. You could, maybe you could tie their shoes for them or help them fill in a, you know, have, with one of the tough problems that they're working on. And you could use your wisdom and help them out with that. So being generous is just finding out where somebody needs something and filling in the gaps. So if you see something and you fill in the gaps, you're a generous person. Now, if you're someone who thinks, oh, they're going to wait for somebody else to do it, then you're a stingy person. And there, of course, the Bible has different things to say about those. So the next is the willow branch. The willow branch is um, represents your the the lips, They're really skinny lips, but it represents your lips. So, <laughs> and it's the only piece that's connected to the etrog, which remember representing the heart. So. And why is that? Because the, the fruit of a man's lips comes from his heart. So that's why they, they connect those, those two there. So that was pretty neat. And then they take this thing and they, they you've seen them like in the, there's, there's, I watched a couple of videos where they're, they're like in Jerusalem within the past few days. And there's like, they're going through the streets and all the streets are lined with all the people with the boxes of all the different types of the four species and boxes and boxes of the etrogs, or the, yeah, the etrogs. And they're all like doing just like that, what they did on Ushbazine. They're like studying these things and they're looking and, and yeah, the magnif <laughs> yeah, they're like, this is the perfect one. They get the magnifying glasses looking at all that. So, and that's to make the, the best offering that they can to God, to build this this uh, of the four species, which is representing them. So they're going to take this and they're going to basically build themselves. And so they want to make a perfect like example of themselves when they put this thing together. <clears throat> and then they go, so the, let's see, the, so this represents them. It rep represents your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength. And then they take this and they go down to the Wailing Wall, I believe, is where they do all the offerings. And they'll they'll be davening and they'll be waving this. And I'm sure they have certain things that they say that the rabbis have said, this is what you do when you do this. And they do it to the four corners, the four directions. So they've done it. And I'm sure that there's a direction. I was like, I wrote down north, south, east, and west because that's just how we say it. But... There's probably a certain order that they have to do it, and, and you know, it's maybe a certain time of day and all that. So that was um, the next part that they do. They so they 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 dive in and they wave it, and so the 
Now they do this to the four corners of the earth, representing like to to the dispersed Jews in the world. They're kind of um, I forget how it was put, but they're like making their offerings and drawing them in, you, like their selves going out. And then the let's see. So the. the and they're also saying to that to take this as to to God, and they're saying like, take this and use me to go touch everyone in the world. That's why they do the four directions. Oh yeah, yeah, they do that. So they do the six directions. So they they cover people in every <laughs> every single way to to say that they're, they're making the offerings to everyone to like draw everybody in and to help themselves be the, the, like the, uh, be the person to go out to touch everybody. And somehow, in the midst of my message being blown into the, uh, what's it, ethosphere? <laughs> um, one little delete button and it's gone. <laughs> Uh, somewhere in there, I've transitioned from the Lulav and the Etrog to the number eight. That segue disappeared, so we're just going to skip tracks now and jump over to number eight. I don't know where it went. I, yeah, there we go. So, so they do this for eight days. <laughs> now we're on the number eight. <laughs> so the number eight signifies new beginnings all throughout scriptures. And so you see the pattern in, in scriptures. It's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, start again. And we like there's there's Adam and Eve. Now they were Adam and Eve were created on the sixth day. Um then their so their first full day, I think they I don't know when they named all the animals, but it seems like they did it on the first day. Because you got I guess it was a really busy day. You know, God created. He did. It seemed to do like he did a lot on that day because he created. He created the, all the animals and the beasts of the earth. He created the birds and everything all in that same day. Then he creates. He's like, you know, basically, I don't want to name all them. I need somebody to do this. So, <laughs> creates Adam. Has Adam name everybody, and Eve's in there somewhere too that day. So, that was a really busy day. Maybe that was one of those like thousand year days. So, because <laughs> if that was just a 24 hour day, that was a really busy day. <laughs> yeah. So, I don't know what, what how they did that, but he named all the animals and all the beasts and all the birds and everything in the one day. Maybe named the fish, who knows? And all in that day. And then God's like, hey, we need a rest, so we're going to take this break tomorrow. So, Adam's first full day on earth is a rest day. So then that's his that's the seventh day and then the eighth day is his new beginning. He starts a full week as the eighth day. So that his basically his first day he can do anything is his new beginning day starts on the eighth day. So then we jump to Leviticus eight thirty three <clears throat> and it's when Moses was um and consecrating or he was preparing his sons for the priesthood and so they were not to leave this is Leviticus 8:33 do not leave the entrance of the tent of meeting for 7 days until the days of your ordination are complete for your ordination will last for 7 days and when what has been done today was con uh, commanded by the Lord to make atonement for you. You must stay at the entrance of the tent of meeting for uh, meeting day and night for seven days and do, do what the Lord requires so that you will not die. For this is what has been commanded. This is what I have been commanded. And this is done. They So they waited for seven days at the door of the tent of meeting. And then uh, Moses comes back. And they are ordained as high priests. So their new beginning. This is where the, the beginning of the whole priesthood thing started. Was with those two. And 
So that that's another one. They say for seven days, eighth day, new beginning. And this is it's interesting on this one that they did that um, after they had been making offerings by fire for seven days, which is what happens now. Somewhere I thought I, now I thought I couldn't find it when I was in my rush mode, but there was I thought it said to make offerings by fire through tabernacles too. Yeah, that's right. So I, I couldn't find that. So, so that's there. It's almost like they're like types and shadows of of Sukkot, and I heard that Sukkot covers like all of everything. It's like a a wrap up of all the different festivals all in one, and that's right. It's such a a big party. So they so they've been making offerings by fire, like like bowls and everything like that, and doing all the stuff, and that's what we're supposed to do here through the seven days. Which we don't do, so we may want to. We may want to look into that. Like, there's a couple of things. Like, yeah, we always have a fire, but we're, I don't, what do we make for offerings? You know, it, what's what's an offering by fire? It does say to make food offerings too every day, so we make food offerings and offerings by fire. So know, maybe you cut a little piece off and let it burn, like they did. So it's like if you didn't eat it all, you had to burn it. So, so they were told like, you know, they had they were. They were they were they were barbecuing at the tabernacle doors, and then when the bowl was when the bowl was when they had eaten all that they needed to, they were to burn the bread and the rest of the meat. So I don't know, I don't know why why there's no leftovers for anything else. It has to be consumed in the smoke because it's I guess it's an offering to God probably. So that's the only way the that's the only way it has to go. So that was pretty interesting that there. They're making offerings by fire, and you're supposed to do that today. And then, knowing where I had already gone with the with the 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 teaching about how what comes up on the eighth day for here, it was pretty interesting to see the all the ties together in the like in the background. So those two are dedicated, consecrated, and set apart, and now they're ready on the eighth day for a new beginning. So then we go to Exodus twenty two thirty. And God says to do the same with your cattle and your sheep. Let them be with their mothers for seven days, but give them to me on the eighth day. And see, Arba's setting up a precedent for the eighth day being special. So there, there's all these setups of for one through seven, eight you start again. And this, this was, uh, so this happens for Shavuot or Pentecost. They count seven sevens from the the Passover. So seven weeks of sevens and then on the on uh, on the eighth day respectively you start again. And so you have you have uh let's see from Shavuot Pentecost. I forget which one started there. I didn't have time to write it down obviously. <laughs> but you go oh it's from Pentecost Passover to Shavuot. So there's your seven days it also happens again when they do the year of Jubilee. So you have seven sevens, and then the next day, the 50th day, is respectively the eighth day, and so there's another new cycle that starts. So it's pretty interesting, all these seven, one more, and you start again. Seven, one more, start again. So very interesting things there was finding the this was actually like twice as long, so sorry about how quick it's going to be. <laughs> the Sukkot has the eighth and greatest day. Uh, that's in the, the, the high priests would go down to the Pool of Siloam and they would get water from the, the, um, the Pool of Siloam, which is it's considered a, uh, a living pool because it's spring-fed. It's still there, too. They found it again. So they, it's a, it's a spring-fed pool, so they consider that living water. And so they, that's their, they, come, they get the water from there. They probably have a great ceremony bringing it up to the temple. And then they're into the temple where they're quoting Isaiah from drinking from the living waters of salvation. Now, and this is the time when now Yeshua goes up there during the same time, and they're having the 
the water libation ceremony, which is supposed, I did a teaching on that a couple years ago, where they, that is considered the, if you haven't ever seen that, you haven't experienced real joy. So that one it must be quite something to see. I wanted to delve into more about what they're actually praying for when they do the, the water libation ceremony. But there's this great, great uh, joyous festival going on, and they bring up the water, and they're at the temple, and they're quoting Isaiah, and Yeshua comes up at the same time, and they they mention about drinking the, from the waters of of salvation, and Yeshua is in the back of the the back of the synagogue, and he's saying, oh, "That's me," because <laughs> because in the when they're actually saying it. When they're quoting Isaiah, they're because they're say, ty, saying in Hebrew, they're saying they're drinking from the waters of Yeshua. Salvation is Yeshua in Hebrew. So they're actually saying his name, and he's in the background going, that's me. <laughs> so, so, um, so yeah, so he's in there, and so now he turns to everyone that probably turns to him and he says on the so on the last and the greatest day of the feast when Yeshua stood stood there in the in the, te in the temple and in a loud voice he says let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink whoever believes in me as scripture has said rivers of living water will flow from within them and that's so they just came from getting the living water they all know it's the living water and now he's saying that's me and so he's in doing that, this is on the eighth day, he is now giving all man, mankind, probably because he is sensitive, so giving all men the chance to believe in him and have a totally new beginning. So you're, you can be totally renewed, everything renewed through him, and he proclaimed it on the eighth day. And then Yeshua himself was, he rose from the dead on the eighth day, giving all creation, anyone who wants to receive him, a chance for full new beginnings. So this is like over and over and over again. So it's like there was. I thought of something on the way here. Was was it Moses or Noah that was eighty when he was told this? Th so there was another eight. This is divisible by ten. And that eight years old, you're to start again. So there's lots of there's something in there. So the. Uh, you know, maybe you start looking into where eights are in your life, and is this, you know, is this a time that things are gonna, you know, time for a new beginning for everyone? So, and then creation itself, you have um, there's the 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 six thousand days of man, where we're gonna be here for six thousand years. Then there's uh, the rapture. And then there's a, a thousand year reign, that's the Sabbath day. And then what happens after the thousand year reign? You go into the eighth day, and there's a new heaven and a new earth, and everything is rejuvenated. Not sure if mom's gonna like the new earth because it says there's no oceans. <laughs> we don't know what that's gonna look like. So, so, um, so this is. Like all, all of the new beginnings, they're all like tied into that on the, on the eighth day is where the new beginnings are. And that's where we're going to with the Feast of Tabernacles or Sukkot, that you're supposed to party strong all week. And on the seventh, on the eighth day, there's a new beginning. So it's the, they say to be very joyous. Some of the things that I was reading, it was like, I'm feeling pretty guilty about how <laughs> I'm like, you know, behaving and acting through the the whole week because it seems like all day long, every day, you're supposed to just be this joyous party mode, and it's like mm, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> so, if you keep reading about that, you know, you may have some some guilty feelings. Yeah, it gets stir it on up. Yeah. So the one one more thing. So there's one more thing, and that was really interesting that the the teacher I was listening to. Um, and thankfully this all didn't come out like sounding a chipmunk because when I was redoing my, redoing all my sermon, I was listening to him on double speed, so. <laughs> so, thankfully for all you guys, I didn't come out in chipmunk mode. Just. <laughs> so, what he had said, it says his children were into music and they played piano and the stuff in the, in the worship music, uh, worship band. 
and that he noticed on the, on the keyboards that this this god of all created all sound and all vibrations and all music musical notes and everything that on the keyboard there's seven notes and the eighth note we'll wait for the car to go by there's seven major notes and then on the eighth note it starts a new octave so even in music he said even in the worship that we're singing to God that it's right in there every single time there's a new beginning on the eighth so if you guys can get ready So Sukkot is God's way of letting us know that there's better times ahead, that in the twinkling of the eye and at the sounding of the last trump, all things will be made new. Thank you, guys. I would have been part of that, but I was rushing and walked right by my shofar. <laughs> so, thank you very much. Hopefully that was good, and I didn't miss too much of my stuff up, but thank you very much. Excellent. That was excellent. Very, very, there's a lot of insight in there. You can see, like, even beyond, there's more layers to that. We'll have to start, start really searching that out. You know, we talk a lot about sevens being a significant number in the Bible, but there is the eighth day. And, you know, even Yeshua being circumcised on the eighth day. It's like, cut off the old, start the new. This is a new beginning, quite literally. <laughs> but it's, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. <laughs> gotta have, gotta have fun. There's joy in the house of the Lord. <laughs> uh, but, but eights are a significant number as far as new beginnings go. And, and you know, like he said, we gotta find out where the eights are in our lives. Where is it that Yahweh has marked? This is a new beginning for you. You know, the old has passed away, the new has come. And and how do we walk into that new? It should be the, the previous seven are a preparation for how to walk out in the new, um, if, we're, if we're walking it out correctly. Um, but, you know, there's a reason why he set things up the way he has. And, and you know, the fact that Sukkot is, it's called a seven-day festival, but on the eighth day you're to do this. It's like, wait a minute, you just said it was a seven-day festival, so now why is there suddenly an eighth day that, that appears? It's almost like he doesn't want it... That's part that fell off the, fell off the plate. That, was that was the connection. Simchat Torah. Simchat Torah. They start restart the readings, that's right. They start restart the Torah readings on Simchat Torah, so after the eighth day... Boom! Now we start the Torah schedule again, and it's and it's like and it's not meant to be. Oh yeah, okay, we're back in Genesis again, and here we go. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. No, it's supposed to be. Now we're coming back around, and it's a new revelation. There's a that we're coming around, and now it's a higher cycle. And now we're coming around, and it's a higher cycle. It's everything he does is in these ascending cycles. You know, we, we I think we had taught on that at one point about the how much in in the universe in creation things are in spirals i mean look at the shofar it spirals up you look at you look at dna it's a spiral look at the how the shells the inside of, of seashells are formed as a spiral and it's like his he's trying to get a picture of things always supposed to be ascending it's not supposed to just be a circle and you run around the same tree over and over and over again but he's causing a new beginning, so now you're going up higher. You're going up higher every time, and um, and like I said, that we got to start looking into that more because there's there is there's so much more in that about the eight, the number eight, and um, and it is it is a t supposed to be a time of happiness, it's a time of joy. Um, joy has nothing to do with what we feel. <laughs> you know, uh, some you can have joy in your heart while everything around you is screaming otherwise. You can have joy in your heart in the most sorrowful of situations. Um, I, I like uh, Nancy Dufresne was talking about the, t the day when her husband went home to be with the Lord. And she said, was that, a, was that a day of great joy and rejoicing? 
it had the opportunity for sadness in it, but she chose joy. You can choose joy, and that joy, the joy of the Lord, will be your strength. It's like that, like the spine of the itra, the the lulav. That is what holds everything up. The joy of the Lord is our strength, no matter what situation we might face in our life. And he's always bringing us to that place. Every time we come to Sukkot, he, it's the time of our happiness. You know, we are so happy. And we said that at a time when it didn't seem like it was a reason to be happy. There was a lot of stuff going on in our lives, as our congregation in our lives, and it didn't seem like it was a time to be happy. But what did we tap into when we were saying, I am so happy? You know what? We, we know about the power of words. And if you continue to confess, I am so happy, eventually your body will start to get in line with it. Eventually, your senses have to start lining up with it. And, you know, while I think even Mark Hankin talks about that, you start laughing, ha, 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 and your mind's saying, what in the world are you doing? You don't feel like laughing right now. But you know what? I think there's a verse in the Bible that talks about that you're, the way you're handling this situation, this is my paraphrase, the way you're handling this situation with joy is going to be a sure sign to your adversaries of their impending defeat. Yes. You know, you're showing the enemy that, you know what, from the beginning of creation, Yahweh had a plan. And his plan ends with you, Satan, being bound in the pit. And it ends with me in the time of the greatest rejoicing. Like you said, when that, when that shofar sounds, everything's going to be changed. All of this won't matter anymore. Whatever we might be facing in our lives, whatever we might have walked through, it's, it's going to be vaporized. It's not even going to play. It's not even going to come into play. And I think it was Dad that said at one point, if it's not going to matter a year from now, why is it bothering you now? You know, we, if we put everything in perspective of eternity and where we're headed, it will make some things in our life to just not matter. That's what the sukkah is all about, coming back to what really matters. And I think it was that whole thing of family and, and family, the family of God is what really matters. We're all sitting here under the sukkah. We're all sitting here in the shade of his presence. And that is what really matters. That's what he's bringing us back to. So, yes, another excellent message, uh, another excellent um, nugget of truth that I think we all need to really expound upon and, and, and really take, take note of that. Start finding where the eights are in your life. Where are the new beginnings that Yahweh has for you? Uh, sometimes it might be just as, as simple as getting a new car. You know, how many people have gotten new cars? Um, or, or something as simple as starting over um, a new job. Things like that mark new beginnings in our lives that are not to be taken lightly. There's something that, that Yahweh has in this season for all of us. And, and there's, there's, there's a higher place that he has for us to walk in. And it's, and it's not this season. You can tend to look at the future through the lens of the past and say, well, this is what the past seven years was like. Well, this is what it's going to be like moving forward. No, God is doing a new thing. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. He's making a way through the wilderness. He's making rivers run in the middle of the desert. It goes right along with Sukkot. Rivers in the desert for us. Amen. Thank you for those of you who joined us tonight. We trust you've gotten something out of this message. We will see you tomorrow night at 630. Until then, you have a blessed week.